Okay. Okay, I guess I didn't uh, animate these in the correct order. So, have you ever heard someone say, by the skin of my teeth? What does that mean and where did it come from? <clears throat> Don't know where it came from, but I've heard it. Yep. Sure. I could say that with what I just told you, the tornado yeah. missed our, where we live by two miles, went right by us. So by the skin of our teeth, which yeah. was close. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also a test to see if anybody did the homework because oh. the, <laughs> it was in uh, Job 1920. Uh, oh, and that explains it says I've escaped by this. I had enough time to read 16, 17, 18, but I did not read 19. So that's why but you're starting at the end, but, and you did say most of it would be the 19 today. So uh, no 16 and 19. All right. Uh, I did read 16. Oh, good. So, so I've escaped death by the skin of my teeth. So that was a phrase that came from, uh, from Job. See, to be honest with you. I read 16 because I said I knew the rest of this group would get 19 and I could rely on them. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, Job 1920 was not in our reading. It was, uh, I mean, it was not in the lesson today, but it was in the outside reading that I asked you to do. So, all right. So, of what do you feel most sure in your life at this point? So I'm not expecting a spiritual answer. So what do you feel most certain in your life at this point? I'll have at least one grandchild visit my house. <laughs> no question. Yeah. I had three last night. <laughs> yeah. All right. So any uh, other on that? Okay. What role best describes the image of God you had as you were growing up? Grandfather, executioner, benefactor, politician, coach, lifeguard, spy, Scrooge, any others? I don't know. I, you know, it was somebody, it was obviously, I think, and what was presented to me as a family, a good German Lutheran family, uh, that he was a guardian and a friend and divine. Oh, that's good. That's good. Hmm. So, what roles would you use to do? Uh, Describe God to a non-Christian friend. Well, you could get in and do, you could be tough by getting into the triune and talk about that. But basically, I would say that basically Elohim is, uh, is love. I'd start yeah. with that first. Yeah, no, I think that would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what? Don't want to start off with uh, the one of the uh, concepts of the Trinity right off the bat. So right, it's hard enough for us to understand that. Well, yeah, that's right. So, yeah. <laughs> and uh, probably the classic explanation I always heard, but it's not really correct. Is well, you know, you're like a son, you're a father, and you're a grandfather. So there you go, three three different persons in one. Well, not exactly what the Trinity is. So that's also a, qu a question, isn't it, about so many people in the boat and two sons or two fathers, and but there's only three spaces in the boat or something. I don't know, it's kind of an old riddle. So how would your unchurched friend just depict God? How would they describe God? Somebody, they, I'm going to speak probably to who I work with the most, and that's, I mean, I, they often talk about it, but it's really somebody that they have not ever become acquainted with. They know that there's, they, 
I never hear anybody, once in a while I hear somebody say, I don't believe in God, but most of the time they'll say, I've heard about God, but I don't think God's in my life, or I, you know, God has not treated me very well, or uh, from those standpoints. The other thing, what you mentioned about father and grandfather, I have to be very careful with that because that wouldn't work very well because most of these guys yeah. don't even know their father and they yeah. don't even know their grandfather. So if I use that example, they're going to go, well, if that's what it is, I don't want anything to do with it because, you know, yeah. my father, <laughs> I was mistreated by my father. Yeah. I did not even know him. Exactly. I think, uh, yeah. All right. So with, with the first round of talks concluded, remember that all three of those uh, friends had uh, something to say to Job and he had a response each time. So in this, so each friend in the same order pressed the argument further. Again, Job answered each argument. This time Eliphaz was more rude, more intense, more threatening, but he said nothing new. He began by saying that Job's words were empty and useless. Then he restated his opinion that Job must be a great sinner. According to Eliphaz, the experience and wisdom of their ancestors were more valuable than Job's individual thoughts. Eliphaz assumed that his words were as true as God's. And it's easy in reading his uh, rant on uh, Job uh, to spot his ar arrogance. So Job uh, then responds in chapters 16 and 17 to Eliphaz. He says, so. Uh, in essence, I've had all I can take of your talk. What a bunch of miserable comforters. And I'm, I'm not sure if that's probably the nicer version of the words he used. <laughs> In cha chapter 18, Bilabad takes a second shot at Job. Bildad thought he knew how the universe should be run, and he saw Job as an illustration of the consequences of sin. Bildad rejected Job's side of the story because it did not fit in with his outlook on life. So it's easy to condemn Bildad because his errors were obvious, unfortunately. However, we often act the same way when our ideas are threatened. So in chapter 19, uh, Job responds, How long will you vex and torment me and break me into pieces with words? So again, we're just going to do... Uh, uh, 16 and three verses from 17 and then 19. So this is, then Job answered, I have heard many things like these. You are all miserable comforters. Is there no end to your empty words? What provokes you that you continue testifying? If you were in my place, I could also talk like you. I could string words together against you and shake my head at you. Instead, I would encourage you with my mouth and the consolation from my lips would bring relief. So he's contrasting here, you know, I would have been nicer than you guys are. So even if I speak, my suffering is not relieved. And if I hold back, what have I lost? Surely he has now exhausted me. You have devastated my entire family. And here, I guess he's talking to God. You have shriveled me up. It has become a witness. My frailty rises up against me and testifies to my face. His anger tears at me and he harasses me. Again, he's, he's talking about God here. He gnashes his teeth at me. My enemy pierces me with his eyes. They open their mouth. Don't touch the mouse. They open <laughs> They open their mouths against me and strike my cheeks with contempt. They join themselves together against me. God hands me over to unjust men. He throws me into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease, but he shattered me. He seized me by the scruff of the neck and smashed me to pieces. He set me up as a target. His archers surround me. He pierces my kidneys without mercy and pours my bile on the ground. He breaks through my defenses again and again. He charges at me like a warrior. I have sewn sackcloth over my skin. I have buried my strength in the dust. My face has grown red with weeping. 
and darkness covers my eyes. Although my hands are free from violence and my prayer is pure, earth do not cover my blood. May my cry for help find no resting place. Even now, my witness is in heaven and my ad advocate is in the highest. My friends scoff at me as I weep before God. I wish that someone might arbitrate between a man and God just as a man pleads for his friend. For only a few years will pass before I go the way of no return. My spirit is broke. My days are extinguished. A graveyard awaits me. Surely mockers surround me and my eyes must gaze at their rebellion. Make arrangements. Put up security for me. Who else will be my sponsor? I wish that my words were written down, that they were recorded on a scroll or were inscribed in stone forever by an iron stylus and lead. But I know my living Redeemer, and he will stand on the dust at last. Even after my skin has been destroyed, yet I will see God in my flesh. I will see him myself. My eyes will look at him, and not as a stranger. My heart longs within me. So, any initial thoughts on this? Okay. Well, as you read through Job, and I, uh, from my standpoint, to what we do and uh, what the guys again, uh, you know, they are all Jobs. <laughs> yeah. They are. They are. You know, why do I need to live? I don't have nothing to live for. I've lost my home. I've lost my family. I have no money. I don't have any place to go. Uh, you know, when you start thinking about it, and then they're parallel to a job, they really are. So a, a role that we play and as a mentor and a, a personal coach to these guys is to begin to realize uh, that, that God does love them. And there is a place in this world for them. And, and there are these times and I mean, I could go on and on, but there's very similar, a lot of similarity on what, who we work with is they're all Job's, believe me. Yeah. Definitely. How does Job feel about his friends now? What kind of comforters have they proven to be? <laughs> and could he do any better? Better seek some new friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of like you walk a mile in my shoes. He's saying, you know, if, yeah. you know, if I was, if you were me and I was you, how would you feel <laughs> the way you've been treating me? Uh, I would hope that you would learn that, you know, that's not the way to treat somebody. Well, it's the fact he tells him, you know, if you were in my place, I could also talk like you. I could string words together against you and shake my head at you. But instead, I would encourage you with my mouth. Right. The consolation from my lips would bring relief. Hmm. That's why he's saying, you guys are treating me like shit. I would not treat my friends the way you're treating me. I mean, I would, I would encourage you to try to, you know, lift you up. But, but they just go on as you see through the next two chapters as if he had not even showed them what they needed to be doing. They were so used to the law. And this is where I, often when you read through these Old Testament uh, verses in scripture, is we have the luxury of Jesus. And uh, at that point, you know, they, they weren't referring to Jesus as saying, hey, you know, you got to understand you're forgiven for your sins. And uh, there was not really, it was more about you idiot, you know, look at how dumb you've been and the That's stupid good. stuff you've done. And and this is why you're suffering. and and. Totally different approach. So there's a lot of interesting things, especially in the, these uh, this sections here. So uh, one commentary views verse 1610, which uh, says, uh, they open their mouths against me and strike my cheeks with contempt. They join themselves together against me. Um, as a parallel to the suffering servant that's in Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. So what are your thoughts? Is this kind of parallel or similar or 
on that comparison. Or no thoughts, no thoughts on that. <laughs> this is not Jeopardy. You got to answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, as far as sequences of books, doesn't Job come before Isaiah? And would Isaiah be using Job's words? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, but as we, we, we look at this passage from our perspective now in Isaiah 53, 3, and we know he was talking about Jesus. Right. Correct. Yeah. Right. But apparently, I mean, the, the similarities, and there, there as we go through Job, there is a lot of, uh, and we talked about yeah. it, I think, are, are one of the earlier sessions, too. Um, Jesus, what, what kind of ex experienced in just a few hours or a day uh, a lot of the, the suffering that uh, Job went through over weeks or months, whatever it was. Um, so there is some kind of uh, similarities as a, the suffering servant or uh, between the two. Okay, so so what words, and I'll read through this again, and I do have some of it underlined. What words does Job use to emphasize that not only his friends, but also God has become his enemy? Uh, Job uses several to imply that God is like a ferocious beast, a traitor, a WWF wrestler, of course, <laughs> an archer, a swordsman. So can you identify which verse or verses Job could be describing these specific attributes of God? So I'll read through these again, and again, some are underlined. So surely he has now exhausted me, referring to God. You have devastated my family. You have shriveled me up. It has become a witness. My frailty rises up against me and testifies to my face. His anger tears at me. And he harasses me. He gnashes his teeth at me. My enemy pierces me with his eyes. They open their mouths against me and strike my cheeks with contempt. They join themselves together against me. God hands me over to unjust men. He throws me into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease, but he shattered me. He seized me by the scruff of my neck and smashed me to pieces. He set me up as a target. His archers surround me. He pierces my kidneys without mercy and pours my bile on the ground. He breaks through my defenses again and again, and he charges at me like a warrior. So any uh, guesses as to where Job's kind of referring to God as a ferocious beast? It's underlined. <laughs> God hands me over to unjust men. No, his anger tears at me. That's oh, I was reading down. I'm way ahead of you. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll take I'll take these in order. So uh, his anger tears at me, and he harnesses me. And then, uh, well, I think uh, you might. Uh, you answered the second one, a traitor. Yeah. And then the WWF wrestler. Scruff to the neck. Yeah. <laughs> and mm -hmm. smashes me to pieces. And then jumps on the ropes and jumps on top of me. Right. Takes a folding chair from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, wait. Uh, let's see. An archer. Well, he sets me up as a target. And then uh, a swordsman, which uh, he charges at me like a warrior, assuming they had swords back then. So, again, some very uh, picturesque uh, language from Job. Mm. Did, this... did you get this from a, from your commentaries? I think there was a, a one uh, 
question on there. Not the WWF, but oh, they're the good. Rest. Yeah. Good. And there is Tony's coming on. We're uh, oh, he's not connected. Tony's coming on. Uh, as we just uh, pointed out, that God is like a WWF wrestler, Tony. So you missed that part. <laughs> He doesn't even know what WWF is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. Morning, Tony. Good morning, Hello. sirs. How are you guys today? We're good. We're always always better when you add a little class to our group. So <laughs> God is good. I am following after great people like you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in what sense... Could Job say his prayer is pure, where he says, uh, I sell sackcloth on my skin. I have buried my strength in the dust. My faith has grown red with weeping, and darkness covers my eyes, although my hands are free from violence and my prayer is pure. Why do you think he says his prayer is pure? He's telling it like it is. There's no fabrication here. Yeah, it's just it's just being honest. I mean, yeah. they might not agree with him, but yeah, I'm I'm just saying what's what's on my heart, what's true. So, Job looks for God for a pledge of security. How is it possible that Job could appeal for help from God when God, when he feels from his perspective? It is God who is apparently attacking him. Because he knows there's no one else. He is the top. Yeah. I just wonder that even if the people that look for my religion <laughs> is going through extreme, I mean, nobody has gone through the sustained amount of suffering this guy went through. I mean, constantly, day and night. And it's amazing that he just didn't say, you know, you know, be with it, kill me. <laughs> just yeah, let's just end it. I am tired of this. Uh, but he he is stubborn. He hangs in there. Yeah, he continues to appeal. Yeah. Okay. Why does Job want to write down his testimony and chisel it in stone? Where it says, uh, yeah, down here, I wish my words were written down and they were recorded on a scroll or were inscribed in stone forever by an iron stylus and lead. What was the question? Why does Joe, Joe want to write down his yeah. testimony? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I would personally, I mean, anybody wants to do that it has to have, they want some legacy in what they've gone through. And, and, uh, so it would, um, it would last, but I'm basically, he's saying if you go on and read it, it's stand on the dust at last. So, and nothing lasts forever. So, he's also saying that God is his witness, yeah. you know, basically. And, and he wants man to know what he went through. Yeah, I think so. He's, he's not writing it down on paper, he's chiseling it in stone. So, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> right. going to be, be there for. Forever for a long time. <laughs> so, um, this may be a, a, a very a subtle question, but are you familiar to other references to an engraving or chiseling in stone, something in a book, possibly in the New Testament? And again, you would have to know, I guess, <laughs> this is a trick question. But anyway, so. Um, 
when uh, they're talking about Jesus is uh, writing our names, those that believe in him and are saved in the Lamb's Book of Life, the words translated as written in is actually chiseled or engraved giving some permanence to your name being in there. It can't be erased. It can't be taken out because it's been chiseled in stone. So anyway. Similar with, I mean, prior to this too, with Moses and 10 commandments. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So he really wanted everybody to remember that. Yeah, when you carried your books to school in those days, it was heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this this part of the, the passage here, is you, there's several things that, I, that we find, uh, to me, was a, a kind of uh, interesting that Job would say these things in, in this manner or this... And again, we talked, this appears to be before Isaiah in the timeline. So now, uh, Job saying, even now, my witness is in heaven and my advocate is in the heights. Do I have a question on that? Let's, um, I wish that someone might arbitrate. I mean, these, how, what do these sound like? Who do they sound like? These words, I got to underline, these phrases. Anyone? <laughs> Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> well, you know, once we said, anytime we said Jesus, that it was right. That's correct. <laughs> See, that's... Yeah. You got to listen. You got it. That's the that's the correct answer, ninety percent of the time in this class. <laughs> yes, it basically is. that's what Christ was saying in the garden. You know, he he wanted he wanted uh, he was a plain, he was pleading to his father that take this away from me, but thy will be done. Yeah. But so so he he he's wanting uh, Job's wanting an advocate. And uh, I mean, we know that Jesus is our advocate, someone that arbitrates for argues for our behalf, sitting at the right hand of God. I mean, it talks all about this in the New Testament. But here it is, Job going through all this shit, and he's coming up with these things that we might expect to see in Isaiah in his ramblings, but so anyway. So what do you find that may, this is part of this too. So amazing about Job's comments. And like I mentioned up here, my witness in heaven, uh, that's for us is Christ. My advocate is in the heights in heaven. That is Christ for us. Sometimes I wish someone might arbitrate between a man and God. And that's what Christ did. He paid our debt. So now we can go directly to God. So, but look at uh, oh, 25 or 23. So, or he says, I wish my words were written down that they were recorded on a scroll or were inscribed in the stone forever by an iron stylus and lead. But I know my living Redeemer and he will stand on the dust at last. Even after my skin has been destroyed, yet I will see God in my flesh. I will see him myself. My eyes will look at him, not as a stranger. My heart longs within me. So this doesn't sound like Old Testament wording to me. Anybody else picking up anything here? This some commentators say that the verse nineteen twenty five is the the pivotal verse for Job. And actually, in another translation, this phrase was is actually the basis for, well, I don't know what's the basis for a song, but somebody wrote a song about this. And I've got the verses on uh, 
the next page, but is nobody else amazed by this, these last few verses here? Yeah, and the commentary that I have, it says at the heart of the book of the Job comes his ring, ringing affirmation of confidence. I know that my Redeemer lives. In ancient Israel, a Redeemer was a family member who uh, bought a slave's way to freedom or who took care of a widow. Uh, what tremendous faith Job had, especially in the light of the fact that he was unaware of the conference, uh, the conference between God and Satan. Job thought that God had brought all these disasters upon him, faced with death and decay. Job still expected to see God, and he expected to do so in his body. Yeah, I mean, this, this is actually, I mean, it's, it's amazing right here. And a king, kinsman redeemer, and which is actually a phrase probably from Ruth, um, is that brought her out from, from basically nothing. And, um, so Man. And it, it goes on and says that even through all this torment and suffering and, and what he was going through, he still believed that God was on his side. Yes, yeah. So, I mean, this, to me, as we got there, I mean, he was, uh, I mean, it's kind of utterly amazing. And it, he has a witness in heaven. He has an advocate in the heights. He has someone that he wishes for, someone that might arbitrate between God and himself. I mean, this is all speaks so much about Jesus. And actually, you know, there really wasn't a concept that uh, people were, back then, were even wishing to see God. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you couldn't even, uh, you know, Moses couldn't look at <laughs> God. And, but but now we, we can do that because of Christ, so not as a stranger what a friend we have in jesus a personal a personal relationship didn't didn't uh that wasn't something they would acknowledge back then right exactly so are you guys now we're talking about all this are you guys not amazed that this is in job yeah after all the, what he's going through the faith that he has is in amazing yeah and so I, I just copied this and i could actually maybe play it but this is uh who taught the sun where to stand in the morning who told the ocean you can only come this far and who showed the moon where to hide till evening whose words alone can catch a falling star well i know my redeemer lives i know my redeemer lives all of creation testifies this life within me cries i know my redeemer she lives yeah, so uh, you can click on this and when I send it out or type this in, because I don't think this is not an active click, but uh, then you can hear the, the song. But uh, so anyway, I, I that's just uh, kind of. Uh, Could you sing a few notes of that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a good singer. I, I kind of I kind of would butcher it. Uh, Wait, let me see. Uh, no, you look at Job and you're looking at Adam, Adam and Eve also. You got to understand that God wasn't, you know, he was not happy. <laughs> I mean, after they, he cursed us forever. And uh, he walked with them and believed in them and loved them, but he cursed it, them also. And you look at Job and where he's gone through all of this, uh, but God, he still believes God loves him. Well, yeah, and I'm not sure. I mean, the... Uh... We always talk about how God cursed him and kicked him out of the uh, Garden of Eden, but he also gave them animal skin clothes. So instead of the the leaves they'd sewn together. Yeah. So actually that was the first blood sacrifice to cover their sin, in essence. When he killed the animals to make their clothes, he allowed uh, them to live uh, 900 years so they could... Uh, populate the world 
and they he made it so that uh, the intermarrying within the families that were not causing any birth defects at that time till they got the populations uh, set up. But you think of how many people they could generate if you were alive for 900 years, could bear children for 900 years, and your children's children were leaving. I mean, like a lot of their children lived for hundreds of years as well. So, yeah. Well, if you go through even from Adam and Eve all the way through the Old Testament, it's a constant of people screwing up. I mean, the first. Yeah the first first degree murder between Cain and Abel. But yet yeah. we come through that and you just continue with these people messing up, but God sticks with them, continues to stick with them. Yeah, that's that's an interesting story too, because you know Abel's blood cried out to God and God's going, you know, where's 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 the Abel? And Cain said, he's not my I'm not my brother's keeper. And uh, then he was afraid that uh People were going to kill him, so he asked God to uh, put a mark on him so nobody would kill him for killing his own brother. Yeah. Where's justice? Yeah. Well, with God. Yep. But now we hear that outcry all the time. Yeah. Where's justice? <laughs> so some of these questions you can just think about. Um, have you ever blamed God for something? Was it justified? Have you felt accused by God? There's several of images of God's provision in this study, uh, which again are surprising even as you read through this. It's a, it talks about a witness, an advocate, an intercessor, a guarantor. Guarantee, guarantor. Thank you. Thank you. A redeemer, king's kinsman, and uh, any of those give you uh, one, especially give you hope more than the others. They all go together. Yeah. I mean, I could not to be tough for me to pick one because it, uh, it be depends on maybe the situation but they pretty much are are all parallel to each other yeah yeah again i was just um i'm reading along with that and i'm going wow this is almost like isaiah or new testament or something that talks about jesus oh and i didn't uh score these in but so job says uh in 1925 but as for me i know that my redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last thought one neither job nor his friends had god's holy word to turn to in times of trouble there were no god-given words of comfort encouragement or guidance no promises of a brighter future or of a coming redeemer yet job knew and believed in god and had a great hope for re redemption in the end Despite all his heartbreaking losses and his devastating disease, Job clung to his faith in the living God. He knew that a loving God would not leave his people in an evil world without any hope of deliverance. I mean, Job's faith is, is kind of amazing, although he, he comes close to uh, uh, cursing God, but he calls him a lot of names in essence, but in this modern world, with every convenience, most people have the advantage of open access to God's holy word at any time. Therefore, we have no excuse for being ignorant of God's wonderful plan of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Christ is our redeemer. He is the redeemer offered up on the cross on the behalf of the entire human race. He is the redeemer for every person who trusts him as Lord and Savior. As our redeemer, Christ saves us from death the penalty of sin that we ourselves deserve. He rescues, delivers, and protects us from this world's corruption and decay. His death paid the price for our sins. When Christ died for us, he redeemed and ransomed us from the grave and offers us the great hope of eternal life. What a great hope. What an amazing Savior. 
Lot two, scripture teaches that Jesus Christ is our great intercessor and advocate. An intercessor or advocate is someone who represents, defends, and protects those who are accused or afflicted. This is exactly, exactly what Christ does. Christ defends us before God when Satan accuses us of sin. He intercedes between us and the Father when we call upon him for help. Keep in mind that Christ lived a perfect and sinless life. Therefore, he is a perfect intercessor for the human race, the only perfect being who has the right to stand before God. God's word actually says that mm -hmm. Jesus Christ stands before God, representing and praying, excuse me, for us continuously. Christ never stops interceding for those who trust in him. As a result, we can never be separated from the love of Christ, our great intercessor, our perfect advocate. Thought three, the same type of scenario is taking place all over the world today. People who used to be good friends are listening to gossip or rumors and spreading untruths about their friends based on lies. While their intentions might not have been evil, the outcome of their betrayal is de devastating. Friendships are ruined and lives are irreversibly damaged. God's word speaks very clearly on the subjects of lying and gossiping or speaking the truth and love and not judging one another. And then in Matthew, it says, refuse to be a critic full of bias towards others and judgment will not be passed on you. So any other thoughts or comments on our passage? You know, I have a question for Tony. Uh, Tony comes from a very Christian community. That's why he's got a name like Tony Harvey, but uh, being from Africa, but uh, I, you know, I know there's a lot going on in this world today. I, you know, I'd like to know, Tony, is your family all right? Is everything going uh, awry in your home country? Uh, or what, have you stayed in touch with uh, your family back there? Yeah, thank you for asking. It's quite peaceful in Ghana. <clears throat> um, West Africa is peaceful. It is East Africa and Southern Africa, Ethiopia and Sudan and those East African countries that are struggling. But Ghana, Togo, Nigeria, those West Africans are, are quite peaceful. Yeah, so thank you for asking. Yeah, I just, because I know that the community you lived in was pretty much Christian. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know if they, you've been infiltrated with Muslims or anything like that at all. So it, they are all over the place. Yes. This Boko Haram, they are, they are in every country, but in Ghana, especially they are in the north. And so they have a territory of their own and they are still radicalized. But um, we have a strong Pentecostal or Christian faith in southern Ghana. So it, it, Ghana is quite spiritual. So it's Niger, part of Nigeria. Yes. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you. Yes, sir. Actually, that question came from Debbie. <laughs> she was getting worried about you and your family. <laughs> thank you so much, yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about, well, like I said, I have uh, several friends that are Coptic Christians and uh, their Easter is this weekend, I think, so. And it's interesting, like, you know, like, I mean, hearing Tony talk about that, but, uh, and I think it's Ethiopia, how Christian that nation is too. With, I mean, their, their whole nation celebrates uh, religious holidays, their religious holidays. And, and uh, uh, yeah, you, you would think that Ethiopia is a Muslim, but they have a strong Christian faith out there. Even though they are being persecuted by the Muslims, they are holding strong. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, any uh, thing to add or updates on the, the prayer list? I just, you know, I would put, I've seen some, I was telling Chuck at the beginning of this, the one thing about destruction and devastation with the tornadoes we've had, and I mean, they, I mean, we had 81 tornadoes total uh, across the way. We had, I mean, 100 and probably 
50, 60 homes completely destroyed. And, you know, God is great. <laughs> I have seen such an outpouring of love and, and uh, support and uh, these people that have come from everywhere. I mean, yesterday there was a group of people from Wisconsin and a group, I mean, people have come from all over the United States, Christian people, uh, come to help. And uh, so when you see that, I mean, they, they've actually uh, have the churches surrounding here have uh, centers where you can go in and sign up and they actually assign you on what day you can go in because there's so many people wanting to help that they, they'd be running into each other. So they had to organize these volunteers. So on what day they will go in and work and what day the others would come out and rest and and the opening of places for these people to live and stay. And uh, I had mentioned the large food chains here, grocery stores have brought in large trucks of non-perishable food, water. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but you know, th th it's just amazing. Uh, it's good to be, uh, you know, a believer in God and Christ, because I'm telling you, those people come out. They really come out to help. So all the prayers go to those people that are coming in and helping. Yeah. It's dangerous work, by the way. Another thing I want to tell you about, you know, grabbing houses that have been blown apart with nails and and splinters, and, and it's not like you know easy work. It's uh, it's yeah. tough work. Okay, let's uh, spend a moment in prayer here. Dearly Father, we. Uh, Thank you for this uh, time in Job. And again, uh, for those not actually spend much time in Job, it's, it's some surprising, uh, really great things in in the in the in this passage. And uh, uh, we thank you for that. We ask for you to be with those uh, that are traveling and uh, safe travels and a uh, great time uh, doing. Like we think, especially Greg and Diane uh, and uh, Greece and. Uh, celebrating their anniversary. We ask to be with others that are, are traveling, vacations coming up in this time of year. And um, we ask you to be with those on our, our, our list that are struggling with uh, disease or recovery from surgery. And, and uh, we just ask you to continue to uh, send your healing hand and blessings on, on those folks. We also think of the uh, recent uh, tornadoes and, and the damage and the devastation and uh, we just ask you to be with those people you be with those that are are coming in to help them um, uh, just keep everyone safe and um, bring restoration and, and comfort to those uh, involved in, in those areas we continually seek your protection for our families and our children and grandchildren thank you god 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 And Father, too, we're coming into uh, this is going to be an interesting year this year, Father. And uh, but we, we look at the, the things going on in our country. We ask, Father, just bring up peace and settlement and a return to your, your values and, and your ways. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So it looks like they're going to clear out some of those uh, protesters, but. <laughs> As I mentioned before, did anyone notice how all the tents across the nation 